I am uh, happy I'm allowed to speak for myself for the previous speaker here. And uh, I'm going to talk about a strange case of global warming. I am not really terribly interested in global warming. Like most physicists, I really don't think much about it. But in 2008, I was on a, I was on a panel here about global warming. And I had to learn something about it. And I spent a day or so, or half a day maybe, on Google, and I was horrified by what I learned. And I'm going to try to explain to you why that was the case. So I also, being on that panel, became very famous. Because if you search on my name and on global warming together, you get roughly 40,000 hits. That's much more than I get if I search on my name on superconductivity, you know. <laughs> so you get sort of into the system. And according to me then, what I said at that time, and I still agree with, the global warming has become a new religion because you can't discuss it. And that's not right. So it starts as, as a, a science came, comes in money forms. It's what I call real science, which I hope I do. Then what it is, we have pathological science, that people who fool themselves. And that happened quite often in science. You do something, you have a theory, you do something, and my God, the experiment shows it. You're very happy and you publish and you fool yourself. You have to be very careful when you publish. Then we have what we call fraudulent science, which is fortunately very rare. Some people cheat in science on purpose. And I had advice to you, if you want to cheat in science on purpose, cheat on something which is not important. Then you won't be found out. You won't be very famous either, but that's another case. And finally, I have, like not finally, I have junk science. Junk science often is in the medical field, well, somebody have five people eating onion soup and five people eating tomato soup, and the five people eating onion soup don't get as much cancer as the five people eating tomato soup. <laughs> and you can publish that, but it's not very good. And finally, we have pseudoscience. And pseudoscience is a very strange thing, because pseudoscience, you begin with a hypothesis, and then you, which is very appealing to you. And then you only look for things which confirm the hypothesis. You don't look for other things. And so the question then, what I'm going to ask, is global warming a pseudoscience? And you can be the judge. So here it starts with the, these two people. There are some pictures of before. If you ask who's a famous scientist in the United States, they say Al Gore. <laughs> And uh, so somebody says to me, you are no business dealing with the global, sign, global warming because you're not a climatologist, but neither is Al Gore, you know. So that's it. And Pochari, who is a railroad engineer. These two people got the Nobel Prize in peace because of this figure here. And I am ashamed of the Norwegian government who did that. This is almost as bad a peace prize, and when Obama got the peace prize, right, he got elected. So the peace prize is a difficult thing to do right, I think. Now, what is this curve here? They are very famous because they, they made this curve famous. And this is the average temperature of the Earth starting from 1860 to roughly 2000. And the temperature change has gone up a point, minus 0.4 degrees, to plus four degrees. 0.8 degrees is what we're discussing in global warming. 0.8 degrees. If you ask people in general what it is, they think it's four or five degrees. They don't know it's so little. It's not even fever. Now, the, the curve, the curve to temp is average over space and time for the whole Earth for the whole year. Now, I'm, I'm dealing with temperature. Normally, in my normal life, I grow cells in tissue culture. And we have to keep the temperature at 37 degrees. And that's very difficult. But the Earth has kept the temperature in 150 years in 0.8 degrees. 
But I don't believe anybody can measure that. It's impossible to measure that. And because in 1880, the thermometers were placed various places. In 1900, they were moved. In 1950, they were moved. In 2000, they were moved. How can you figure the average temperature on the Earth? I don't think that's possible. If I gave 10 people the job of measuring the average temperature in this room, you will get 10 different answers. So that's a very difficult thing to do. So what does it mean, then, this curve here? And in my opinion, it probably nothing. <laughs> because, I mean, why does it matter if the temperature is going up 0.8 degrees, the average temperature, if indeed you could measure it? So from 1880 to 2013, the temperatures increased, and from 288 degree Kelvin to 288.8 degree Kelvin is 0.3%. It's very little. And if it's true, it means to me the temperature has been amazingly stable. I was amazed that the temperature can be so stable. And from 1975 to roughly then 2000, you get this curve here, and the CO2 and the temperature increased in common. And that's what the problem is by the CO2 causes the temperature change. CO2 has very little to the, to the temperature change. Boulder vapor is a much, much, much stronger uh, green gas than the CO2. If you look out of the window, you see the sky, you see the, the clouds, and you don't see the CO2. And then you come to the hockey stick graph, which the previous speaker showed in a little different matter. And I have to say, that, that I have to rely on H.C. Anderson and the emperor's new clothes. The, 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 but the little boy was innocent. He didn't see that the, the emperor had clothes on, and I, in the little boy here, I don't see that the CO2 is the cause of all this problem. For example, then I showed you before, the temperature going up from 288 to 288.8 degrees, 0.3 percent. In this, in this 150 years, the Earth population had gone up from 1.5 billion to 7 billion. Nobody talks about that. And maybe, for example, that the, all the paved roads and cut down forests has to cause of the global warming, not the CO2. But nobody talks about that. And actually, some person do. This is. Uh, Stephen Shu, which is a Nobel Prize winner from 1970, 1977, and he suggested to paint all roof white because that might help. So he, at least he's a, he, I know him very well, he's a smart guy, but he's been bought by the global warming people in, 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 and he's now helping Obama trying to make green energy in the United States. So how come, have you heard about the Copenhagen meeting, how come that can be? Well, it can be because of societies like the American Physical Society. I, as you heard, I resigned from the American Physical Society because this statement, the energy is incontrovertible. American Physical Society discussed the mass of the proton. The mass of the proton is not incontrovertible, according to the American, to the, American Physical Society. But the global warming is. See, that's a religion. That's a religious statement. Like the Catholic Church says the earth is not round, and the Physical Society says that the global warming occurs. I mean, that's a terrible thing. So I resign from the Physical Society. I hope I can get one or two of you to resign as well. <laughs> now, the, now, the other thing is, you see here, the other is this, this statement taken directly from the American Physical Society. It says, the global warming is occurring if non-mitigation action are taken, significant disruption in the Earth's physical and ecological system, social system, security, and human health are likely to occur. So let's see, look at history. In the last 150 years, the Earth has got warmer, according to the, these people. But the human health has got better. Your soul system is better. Everything is better. The Earth had much better than it was 150 years ago. So where, why is it suddenly changing? Why is it suddenly getting worse? It's a mystery to me. 
So then the, they had a meeting in Cocoon, and what they did get there is typical of a paper. Oxfam report showed that 21,000 people suffered blood-related death during the first nine months of 2020. Twice as many as the whole 2009. These are the tidbits you see in the paper, trying to convince people that global warming is a terrible thing. And I think that's a strange thing. Now we have a recent meeting in Brazil, and if you read in the paper, nothing much has been coming out from that. You, you, I could hardly find it, but I prepared this slide. And what they try to do is to concentrate on sustainable development. And they can all agree with that. But one thing you should be very careful, you should not confuse pollution with CO2. CO2 is not the pollution. We are all agree that pollution is a bad thing and so on, but it has nothing to do with CO2. So what is the greenhouse effect then? You ever heard about it already? What it is, is that the, without the atmosphere, the Earth would be roughly 35 degrees colder. If, this, if the fact is that CO2 has increased from 280 to 350 parts per million in 100 years, temperature has increased 0.8 degrees C, is there a cause and effect? Oh, well, you can try to test that then. Since 1998, it was the warmest year measured, CO2 has increased up to 396 parts per million. So we can then calculate what the effect of the temperature would be. The very simplest calculation is 0.8 times 4 divided by 100 is 0.1 degree warmer. But it's colder today. It's colder now than it was in 1998. That's 15 years or so. How can that be? If CO2 is increasing regularly, it should be warmer. But it's not. So here you see the curve. This is the CO2 increasing. This is the temperatures in 1998. And you see here in, 19, I think it's 1908, suddenly it dropped maybe 0.5 degrees or so. Almost got rid of all the global warming entirely in one year. So you recognize the difference of measurement is very difficult. And so you, you can't really measure it. That's, that's what bothers me that both the, both the people who believe in global warming and the people who are deniers Accept the curve. That curve should never be accepted. So here is where the temperature is measured. This is according to NASA, Goddard Institute for Space Research. So here, United States, all these dots are places where temperature is measured. Between 30 and 60 degrees, you know, the United States is almost completely green. But look below 60 degrees, 60 degrees south, there are eight thermometers. That includes the South Pole. There are only eight thermometers there. How can they talk about average temperature of the Earth? I don't understand it. And furthermore, if I ask this rhetorical question, what is the optimal temperature for the Earth? It's clearly not the temperature we have. That would be a miracle. So the, but nobody knows what the optimal temperature is for the Earth. It may be two degrees warmer, Maybe two degrees colder, I just don't know. But it clearly is not the temperature we have today. So nature, of course, has gotten into the effect, and they have a journal now called Climate Change. My friend said, don't make fun of nature, then they won't publish your papers. <laughs> I said that nature doesn't publish my papers anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, Nature then, this, this, this issue, I, guess I found out there were several issues, but this issue was free, so I looked up, and they grow corn in Africa. And they found out, there's a big article in this paper, that for one they, they lose 1% for every day in over 30 degrees C. That's a very difficult thing to find out. Maybe true, maybe not. But if you think about the corn farmers in Iowa, that they are probably maybe a hundred times as efficient as the people in Africa because of the climate and the, all the things we have in the United States. And they grow corn. Unfortunately, what we do with that corn, we turn most of it into ethanol. And they mix, in New York State, they mix 10% ethanol into the gasoline. And so it affects me directly. Every time I buy gasoline, I have to buy 10% ethanol mixed in the gasoline. Much less inefficient and very costly for the country should never have done that. And 
They don't mention at all in here how, how important CO2 is for plant life. And so if you have more CO2, the plant grows better all over the earth. If you have a greenhouse and put carbon dioxide in it, the plant grow faster. Plants, CO2, of course, is food for plants. And believe it or not, the great trees in Bad Sachen are starving. They don't look like that, but they really are, because when photosynthesis was developed, the carbon dioxide was much higher in the air than it is today. So the plant have a system which is geared for a much higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So here is uh, other things. So you see all these kind of things. I see, I pick and choose when I give this talk, like my previous speakers picked and chose too. So I pick and chose, and I really like this one. This is the body shrinks because of global warming. And all these kinds of things, like the, I mentioned, I've seen that the strawberries have gotten smaller these days, for example. The red-billed gulls, California squirrel lynx, wood rats, large number of things get smaller because of global warming, because of the 0.8 degrees average. Now, unfortunately, this does not apply to people. <laughs> My observation is that people get bigger as far as the people, global warming, of course. So here we come then to see, remember, everything is caused by global warming. And then people, it doesn't get any warmer. So we can't really talk about that. We have to talk about something else. We like to talk about climate change. Okay. So if I look up then, it takes 30 years to define the climate, according to the people who should know. So when did the climate change? Yesterday? Five days ago? Five years ago? I don't know. But that's what people talk about climate change. And you may have noticed that when you talk about climate change, it's always to the worse. Nobody says, oh, I'm so glad the climate is changing and getting better. But nobody says that. When you say climate change, you mean it's getting worse. And here's a thing which is difficult to see maybe from you, so let's focus on this graph here. This is from the Midwest United States, and this is the rainfall over a hundred years. And you see in the Midwest United States, there was a very dry period, which is called the Dust Bowl. It became very famous because of John Steinbeck wrote The Grape the Wrath. But you see, this happened long before now, and here's another hundred years from a place in Africa, huge amount of rain. See, these climate things that happen as always have happened. Okay, even if you're, if you're religious, you know about the Noah's the flood in the Bible, you know, that's, a, that's really a giant flood. I mean. So the climate has always changed. And then we come to people who are specific. And uh, the, the, what I really like is this thing here that says melting Greenland. They don't say the ice melts on Greenland. It sounds much worse. You would say Greenland is really melting, you know, you know. And they show these pictures of flood. So they look at this just for to pick something. And actually, if all the glaciers in the world melt, the ocean will rise one meter. If all the ice on Greenland melt, the ocean will rise seven meters. If all the ice on the South Pole melts, the ocean will rise 93 meters. But the fact is that there's more, there more ice in the South Pole now than there ever has been, because it's colder. You know that the previous speaker talked about the, the, southern, the, the northern hemisphere, which is getting a little warmer, but the southern hemisphere is getting colder. So that's the way life is. Now, here is a paper by, a, by if I know about this guy, it's Ola Johansson, he's a Norwegian. They have measured the ice on inland on Greenland, scientifically by using satellites. And since there's a Norwegian guy, I'm from Norway, it has to be true, you know. <laughs> and they have found out the last 11 years or so, the ice on the Greenland has risen five centimeters a year on the inland of Greenland. Well, you are seeing pictures from the coast, but the inland is increasing. So there's more ice on Greenland now than it was like 15 years ago. And this is a wonderful fact. If you don't believe that, you can look at Google. And here I, I picked up, there's several harbors in Greenland. This is the five coldest years I measured, the five warmest years. Up now, week, these are the coldest years, and these are the warmest years. They're the warmest years were basically in the 30s. 
But we didn't worry about the Greenland melting at that time. And that's true for all the temperatures in Greenland. And the coldest years include 92 and 93, you know, 92. And so the coldest year happened more recent than the warmest years. But so, the, so we don't have to worry about Greenland. So since it's difficult then for the people to talk about climate change, you know, from the previous speaker talked about extreme weather. Now that's something, you know. But you say every time you have extreme weather, you have, you have a hundred year flood. That means it happened a hundred years ago as well. See, the weather is no more extreme now and it never been been. When, when we had a big catastrophe in the United States, when New Orleans was almost wiped out of the map, we had eight hurricanes that year. Huge, uh, the papers say, this is the future. This is global warming. This is what we have to expect. The next year, there was no hurricane in the United States. Nobody wrote in the paper say, there are no hurricane. this must do the global warming, this we can expect, you know. Only when disasters happen, you get into the act and say, this is bad. So you feel then you have to sort of, you know, extreme weather that you have, when the ocean rises, you have to run away from it. But that, of course, is not the fact. And so the question you ask, is the ocean level increasing? And if you look at this curve here, this is a thousand years on this scale, 8,000 years ago. This is meters here. So the ocean has risen 15 meters in 8,000 years. If you look at the recent years, is this curve here. And this is the recent years. The ocean, this is now centimeters, and this is 100 years. So the ocean has risen 20 centimeters in 100 years. It wrote 20 centimeters in the previous 100 years, and so the last two, 300 years is written roughly 20 centimeters a 100 years. But, uh, please note, there are no unusual rise of sea levels. It's not unusual. And to be sure you understand that, I'll repeat it. <laughs> there is no unusual size in the sea level. So you've got, to, you've got to, see, these are the facts people don't want to admit to you. They say the sea level is rising. Yes, it is. So that's just 20 centimeters a century. That's what it does. So here then is going back to Al Gore. This polar bear is very famous because he's running out of ice. And the poor, the cuddly polar bears are dying. So, but this is the real culprit, the guy with the gun and the polar bears. And I'm, as I said, I'm from Norway, and Spitsbergen is the protector of Norway. It has polar bears on it. And in 1972, there were roughly 100,000 bears there. And now, in 2005, there are 4,000 bears there. The reason for that, of course, you weren't allowed to hunt them anymore. They were protected. And what everybody in Norway knows, but you probably don't know, is there are more seals now than there have been for a long time. But seal is what polar bear eat. Because people have stopped buying seal skin coats. And the Canadian and the Norwegian who used to club little seal babies to make these beautiful coats don't do that anymore. So it's a huge amount of seal, which is what polar bears eat. So, when I resigned from the Physical Society, I got this wonderful problem by a guy named Samson, and I really like that. You consider a large room, 20 feet square, 10 feet high. Actually, let's, let's take this room. This is, a, this is a very large room. And I, the question that he asked is, if I, if I seal this room off, how many matches do I have to write, light every day to keep up with the increase in the carbon dioxide in the air due to all the cars spewing out gasoline and stuff. There are roughly maybe 800 million cars in the world. So how many matches do I have to light in this room to keep up with the carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere every day? And this is a good problem for physicists. I was surprised when I saw the problem. But the facts are that for this room, for this room here, if you light, say, one match, you're probably equivalent to three years of car spewing carbon dioxide into the air. So one match in this room is equivalent to all the carbon dioxide these cars in the world put up in the room. If you take this room here, it happened to be 20 years. 
but this room is much bigger. That's an amazing thing. See, the atmosphere is much, much bigger than you think it is. And it's a relatively easy calculation, and I hope you try to do that tonight, and you will learn, you know, something about that anyway. So, but you are sitting here listening to me, and you are polluting this room with carbon dioxide as well. So much are you doing that? Well, if you, if you, you need roughly 2,000 calories a day. So let's take sugar as the food. And if you do that, you have to eat three moles of sugar a day, which is 2,000 calories. And the sugar will weigh 450 grams. But the carbon dioxide you breathe out weigh 800 grams, more than the sugar, of course, because you get the oxygen from the air. So every day you breathe out roughly 800 grams of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent to 400 kilos a year, speaking of 40 tons in a lifetime. That's what you breathe out. And, but of course, it's only about roughly 4% of the total emission because you, you, you drive cars and you heat your house and you drive in airplanes and stuff. So it's only 4%. So it doesn't help to save the world if you go on a diet. You don't have to do that. It doesn't do much. The other thing is that the green want this solution. When I see Bid Mills in California, I shudder because I see my tax money go out the window. <laughs> and, of course, this is the right decision, atomic or nuclear plants. And I know about the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan. Never did one which causes Germany to ban nuclear power. That was a wrong decision of Germany, and I know they will reverse it. I have a, can make any kind of bets on that. And I know here now, in the tsunami in Japan, actually it was a dumb thing from the Japanese to begin with to build a nuclear power in an earthquake-prone earthquake area. But it was the, one of the biggest earthquakes ever have been seen on this earth, and what happened is that 100,000 people, roughly speaking, died in the catastrophe, and as far as I know, not a single person died from radiation. But we are so worried about radiation. That's wrong. Nuclear power is the most safe power if you, if you uh, pay kilowatt hour produced. So here and then there are many ways to spend money. And uh, I, I feel, do you, do you feel good using solar cells? I mean, do you feel good using solar cells, wasting your money the, the manufacturing capability of the country and everything else using solar cells. So here then is a real problem from New York City in 1900. You may think I'm joking, but somebody had written a book about this. The real problem in New York City was how can we get enough horses? It's not a joke. It was a real problem. And there was dead horses laying in the streets of New York at that time. And the other problem, of course, how can I get rid of the horse manure, you know? And so now we laugh at that problem. But I say 50 years from now, people look at us and say, how could these people be so stupid not using nuclear power? How could they possibly be? So, so it's a question I asked then, are we afraid of chance, or change? And this is an American character who is not afraid. We want me worry. And here is a picture of the Earth in some millions of years. The Earth is changing. Things are changing, for heaven's sake. We can't keep still the same. This is the American foreign policy. They try to keep things the same because we have it well in America. So their policy is to keep things unchanged. But even the foreign policy of the United States can't manage to do that. And we certainly can't manage to keep the Earth just indifferent. So we have, I think we have to learn to live and change, that's one thing. And uh, here's a picture of myself, my wife and me. We got married roughly 60 years ago. This is how we looked. This is how we look today. You see? <laughs> We've changed. And notice, <laughs> unfortunately we have changed. And notice also that the new picture is a color picture. There was no color when I got married. So. 
as, as far as I'm concerned, we have left the world in a better shape than we have arrived, and this will continue. And so here is some Antarctic ice core, which I have been showing this here. Roughly every 100,000 years, we get an ice age. That will happen now. You see that will happen in ice age. People lived, this is uh, 800,000, 400,000 years ago, that lived, people lived on the earth through these changes. And, but they come and they look like we are ready for another ice age. Not for, and then people say, well, please, burn some coal. <laughs> you know, keep warming up the earth. And the other interesting thing about this is that the blue line is the temperature, and the temperature increases before the carbon dioxide. And a lot of peddling and writing and things to try to get that changed around. But the facts are that these are the experiments. So finally, then we get to the end. And uh, this is from The Economist. Don't despair, grounds for hope on global warming. And if I, if I ask the rhetorical question, is climate science a pseudoscience? And if I'm going to answer the question, the answer is absolutely. So thank you very much.